Hello, I'm Peter Houston, the archivist at Mount Royal, and this is a brief video introduction to our collections. Um, our collections, you should know, are, are open to everyone, um, not just students and faculty, but the general public, and they're really meant to uh, support teaching and research at Mount Royal, so we, wanna, we want them to be used. Um, so certainly if, if you want to take a look at anything that I'm going to show, uh, you can always get in touch with us and we can make it happen. So here is one of our collection storage rooms. We have, our, our collections are, are kind of, they're pretty big, uh, and we're not going to have a chance to kind of go over everything, but what I'm going to do is just show you some highlights. I'm going to give you an idea of, of some of the different types of primary sources that we hold, and, and also these will be kind of indicative of the, uh, the types of records that you can find in archives generally, not just in our archives. And I'm going to also uh, explain or, or kind of detail um, a few of the collections that we have uh, that might be of interest to you. So. so a lot of our holdings have to do with the history of Mount Royal. Uh, Mount Royal originally started out as a college uh, in 1910 in downtown Calgary and, and then became a, a university about 100 years later. Um, so this is a picture of the original Mount Royal College building uh, in downtown. It's since been demolished, but it's right, the site of it, it was right beside the Kirby Center, uh, which you might know there's the LRT stop. And the Kirby Center itself was actually the second sort of building uh, for Mount Royal when it outgrew this original one. So uh, yeah, so let's, let's look at a number of, um, I'm basically drawn a, uh, a bunch of examples of types of records uh, from our, our kind of Mount Royal related collections. And I'm just going to yeah, briefly go over them to, again to give you a sense of what we have, but also the types of records that you can typically find in archives. So what we have here, uh, these are meeting minutes from the Board of Governors of Mount Royal. They date back to the 1930s. Um, now these types of records, uh, these kind of text-based documents are known, known sort of collectively as textual records by archivists. Uh, and these tend to form the majority of what most archives typically have. So this could be everything from yeah, meeting minutes like these to handwritten diaries and journals, uh, correspondence files, reports, uh, all that kind of thing. These are you know rich sources of information for historical research. Let's move along. So Archives tend to be focused on unpublished records, so so things like I just showed you that there's just one copy of. Um, now, we also do have a decent number of publications, even though publications tend to be more what, say, libraries focus on. We are the library special collection, so we also have a lot of kind of rare books and, and other publications like these uh, relating to Mount Royal history. So here we've got academic calendars, yearbooks, student newspapers, newsletters, and other other uh, publications that were were published on campus, um, and yeah, which which are great sources for learning about sort of student life or or kind of cultural life on campus. Here we have uh, some interesting uh, ones. These are two rolls of honor. So these were created uh, after the two world wars. So on the left we have the one from from World War One. On the right the one from World War Two, and uh, these list the names of all the students and faculty. Uh, that served in the armed forces during the conflicts. Uh, so an interesting kind of look at, at Mount Royal's military history. Um, you can see, unfortunately, of course, you know, given the nature of war, there's a lot of names with little stars or crosses beside them. Those are, those are students, um, mostly students that, that uh, died in action um, or, or of wounds or disease. So yeah, uh, kind of brings, brings it home. We've got large photographic holdings as well, tens of thousands of photographs spanning the history of Mount Royal, uh, going right back to the earliest years. So this is a photo of the lacrosse team from 1912. Um, you can see, yeah, they're in a studio somewhere uh, with the cheesy backdrop. Um, but yeah, we've got some some great uh, great photos that really illustrate the history of this place. We've also got architectural plans. So here are here's an architectural drawing from the uh, Lincoln Park campus plan. So Lincoln Park campus was uh, basically is, is the campus that we have today, the suburban campus in the southwest that uh, Mount Royal moved to in the early 70s when they just outgrew that downtown location. Um, so we've got the plans for the building as well as, uh, you know, here is a picture of, of the completed campus uh, soon after it opened. Um, one kind of neat thing 
is that they built, uh, like Mount Royal today sits on what used a uh, piece of land that used to be a military airfield that was heavily used in the Second World War. And in these old pictures, you can actually see at the top left, you can actually see a bit of the old runway uh, still in existence. Now, physical objects like three dimensional uh, items or, or artifacts tend to be more the preserve of museums and galleries. Uh, but every archives does tend to, to end up with, with a lot of these too. So here's just a couple examples. We have, um, you know, badges uh, from sports uniforms. Um, we've also got a little medal here awarded to a, an early student, Ida Schrader, uh, for her excellence in shorthand and, and typewriting, uh, made of sterling silver. Uh, kind of interesting too, I think this is indicative of the types of courses that were actually open to female students in those, those early decades. A lot of kind of secretarial stuff, as you might expect. Um, we also have large audiovisual holdings. So you might not think of this kind of material when you're thinking archives. You might be thinking more like, you know, old papers and photographs. Um, but we do have a lot of video recordings, audio recordings. So here, uh, are just some examples, um, a lot of them on, on old sort of obsolete formats, uh, but yeah, recordings of building openings, convocations, special events that took place on campus, uh, some really cheesy promotional videos from the 80s uh, that I kind of like. Um, we've also got there the box contains oral histories on audio cassette um, that were recorded back in the 90s. So uh, these can be, oral histories can be such a rich source because you're hearing eyewitnesses to events um, talking about uh, what they saw, what their experience was, you know, how they participated um, in their own words. So uh, yeah, they can be really, really great sources. Um, you'll see too, there's some some CDs, DVDs there. Uh, now this is something too that archives tend to be receiving more and more of is digital records. Um, if you think, you know, if you're trying to document the history of the past 20, 30 years, or the history of, of kind of today, contemporary history, um, you think most of the records being produced are going to be done in, in uh, digital formats. Um, how can you talk about today's society without, uh, you know, having, say, social media posts and emails and websites and that kind of thing? So more and more archives are receiving those and trying to preserve them and make them accessible, which is actually a lot harder than preserving uh, sort of paper records, but... Okay, let's move away from kind of Mount Royal history and look at a couple of the collections uh, that I mentioned that we have that aren't don't have anything to do with Mount Royal history, but they do. Uh, we've we've acquired them to support teaching and research in some of the the different disciplines and programs that we have here at Mount Royal. So, what you're seeing here, uh, this is an example from our medieval and early modern manuscript collection. This is a uh, leaf. Um, so this is like a torn out page, a single page. Um, from a Bible from around the year 1250. So yeah, we're talking like almost 800 years old here. Uh, this uh, th this collection definitely holds uh, the oldest um, material that we have in the archives. About 50 manuscripts or partial manuscripts, pieces of manuscripts like this, um, that really illustrate kind of book production uh, and sort of artistic practices uh, in, in the Middle Ages. So this this is uh, was written on parchment on animal skin that was used was the sort of most commonly used writing uh, material in the Middle Ages, and uh, and it's it's very cool because it's very small for one thing it's like the size of a small paperback, um, and the text so the text is tiny 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 probably two millimeters tall it would have all been written by hand manuscript means handwritten. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's staggering to think of a scribe writing out the entire Bible by hand, uh, you know, by candlelight or the light of the sun. Of course, this would be all, you know, all natural kind of sources then, uh, using a quill. And, uh, and then they've, they've also kind of made this text quite beautiful with uh, some, some uh, illuminations, the sort of illustrations you see here. So there's a little initial uh, decorated initial there with a picture of the Old Testament prophet um, Obadiah. Uh, this is this is an excerpt from the book of Obadiah, so they have his picture there. Um, and on the other page we have a funny little elongated griffin uh, between the two the two columns of text. Um, this is probably probably doesn't really illustrate the text directly. It might be more of just 
just you know something beautiful to kind of amuse the reader. Um, this kind of decoration too, also um, uh, decoration would sort of help honor the text. You know, this is a sacred text, the word of God. So you want to make it as beautiful as possible. So yeah, just th th this is a really cool collection. Again, not only because it's so old, some of the stuff is almost a thousand years old, um, but uh, but yeah, when when else do you get to see medieval manuscripts uh, in, in Western Canada? So uh, we use this for a lot of classes, English classes, you know, medieval history classes, art history, religious studies, uh, gets used an awful lot. There's some really neat stuff in there. Okay, moving along, we've got a lot of uh, interesting kind of rare books and, and other kind of specialty publications. This comes from the early print collection, which focuses on the first uh, decades and century or so of, of uh, print, uh, like book printing production in Europe. Um, so this one comes from uh, England uh, under Elizabeth I, uh, this is from about the year 1590, and this is a prayer book meant for kind of ordinary people to use. You can see it's in English. The other, the medieval uh, Bible leaf that we just looked at was in Latin, the language of the, the medieval church. Um, but of course, in Protestant England, uh, there was a real focus on, on uh, ordinary people reading scripture themselves in their own language in the English vernacular. Um, so you can see that reflected here. You can you can read it. Um, and one of the things I love about this book is the fantastic illustrations. So you can see it has these incredible, uh, incredibly detailed woodcut borders. Uh, these ones, it has a very grim theme. This is uh, the dance of death. So you can see, da uh, sorry, uh, death personified as a skeleton in each of the scenes, leading off different members of Elizabethan society uh, to the grave. Um, and uh, basically the message, this, this was sort of a recurring motif in, in medieval art, and the real kind of message of, of the Dance of Death was, you know, everyone's going to die, no matter if you're the, the richest, most powerful person in the kingdom, or you're a lowly, you know, beggar, uh, everyone eventually will die, so uh, you should put your trust in, in God, you know, pray for salvation. Um, sort of a moralistic message, very appropriate for the time. So, uh, yeah, so I think this is such a fascinating uh, book on so many levels. It'd be great for kind of looking at Elizabethan social history, but also would tell you a lot about, about the Reformation and sort of changing ideas of, of faith, uh, belief, and sort of everyday um, uh, practice in, in England. So, now sticking with England for a moment, we have here a collection of letters. Uh, this comes from the uh, Patterson English Manuscript Collection, which is a, a collection, sort of a later collection of manuscripts um, from the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. Very eclectic. Uh, Diana Patterson uh, is, is an English professor who's now retired, but has donated a lot of amazing stuff to the archives, including these. And so yeah, uh, the examples you have here, these are handwritten letters from the 1830s. Uh, pertain to the administration of a noble estate uh, in, in New Romney uh, in England. So, Moving on to Canada, we have here some examples from the Raikman Canadian Communist Pamphlet Collection. Uh, and this contains about 50 pamphlets that were published, created and published by the Canadian Communist Party and the Labour Progressive Party. Uh, and they are just a fascinating, uh, provide a fascinating insight into these sort of priorities and activities of, of you know, these, these very um, sort of socialist communist parties uh, at the time um, in, in sort of the Cold War period. So the 50s, 60s, 70s mostly. Um, some really interesting uh, kind of propaganda stuff. And yeah, quite, quite interesting if you're studying leftist politics or kind of labor issues in Canada. So uh, this is one of our largest collections. So we received this one last year. This is the Blaine Canadian Sports History Collection. So Bob Blaine, a local guy, donated his amazing collection of about 7,000 items uh, to us uh, that he'd been collecting for 40 years. So it's, it's a real major thing. Uh, really covers the history of Canadian um, hockey. Uh, about 60% of the stuff is related to hockey. There's also a lot of football, Calgary Stampede, um, golf, and baseball as well. Um, it consists of, of a variety of things, a lot of game programs, uh, as well as, you know, magazines, photographs, even things like ticket stubs, trading cards, 
Um, yeah, really, really great source if you're looking into Canadian, Canadian sport. Here, just to give you a sense of the size of this collection, this entire row that you see is, is just Blaine stuff. Um, and he meticulously organized it all into these binders. So a rich, rich source. Uh, again, if you're studying Canadian sport, or it could be useful for a lot of other research topics as well. Um, there's some great advertisements in there if you're looking at kind of marketing history, uh, some interesting stuff about, you know, gender and masculinity, as you can expect in this kind of stuff. So, yeah, very cool. Okay, so just to wrap up, wrap up um, how to access uh, our collections. Well, ordinarily, you could come into the archives. Uh, we're located in the library up on the fourth floor. You could sit in our reading room, request the sources. We'd bring, you know, the original material out for you to work with, like these students are. Um, things are a bit different in the pandemic, though. We can't have you come in because the, the archives and most of the library building are, are closed at the moment, but you can go to our, uh, we have an online database. So if you go to the site archive search, go to archives.mtworld.ca, you can search through finding aids. These are, these are descriptions of all of our collections. And um, then you can get in touch with us. If you find something that you'd like to look at, you can get in touch with us. And what we've been doing has been digitizing sources and sending them uh, to, to researchers. So feel free to get in touch with me. Uh, my email is up at the top right. You can see phouston at mtworld.ca. And yeah, I'm always happy to help you with, uh, with your research or if you just want to learn more about the archives. All right, thank you.